Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of the Pinnacle Investment Summit. My name is Ramson Jaju, and I'm the leader of the Pinnacle Retail Business. But more importantly, I will be your host again for this morning's session. This will be my last session and I'll be ho um, that I'll be hosting because I will be handing over the reins to Matthew Dell, another director of distribution, who will host the last two days of the summit. Now, in terms of today, I'm really excited about the program we have in store for you. From the onset, I'd like to say that the divergence in performance between value and growth style of investing has taken me personally back to a time when I started in the, in in the industry as an analyst. I was a research analyst at Retire Invest, now part of the IWF group. And at that time, basically it was 1996. It was the early stages of the tech bubble. Basically, we had numerous managers on our Retire Invest uh, approved product list and uh, they were starting to become performance challenged. If you think about 96, by the time 97 ticked over, some of these managers were delivering five, maybe 10% below benchmark performance. But by 1998, things started to look even more challenged. So as the research and investment team, we were calling in the CIOs and the PMs of these value managers into our boardroom, and we were asking for a please explain. Because as an, ad as an advisor or as a researcher, any of you on our call today, the most difficult role that you have is to stick by a manager and a style when it is out of favor. The easiest thing to do perhaps is to jump on momentum or jump on last year's winners. Well, we had a global equities value manager who was in our models back in 1998 and he was 35% below benchmark over a 12 month performance period. And as we know in 98, there was still a couple of years to go before the tech bubble actually pricked and burst. So can you imagine the pain that continued for quite some time? And the typical answer for most of the PMs and CIOs at the time was that they could not va find value in a pretty much um, tech growth um, and stretch valuations market. And most of these PMs said that they would not be changing their investment thesis and they will stick to their knitting and stick to value style investing. Well, post the tech wreck and over the next three, four, five years, the same value managers and even the one that was doing minus 35% below benchmark delivered double digit alpha year in, year out. It was a massive shift and it happened quite quickly. It is these types of experiences and stories that highlight why portfolio construction is critical and blending styles is perhaps the best way to manage your overall portfolio risk. I'm sure everyone on this webcast today is thinking, are we close to that turning point when value will start to outperform strongly again? At Pinnacle, we're truly fortunate that we have two of the market's leading global equity managers in Hyperion and Antipodes, and indeed, they are the best in their styles, best in growth and best in value style investing. And their track record speaks volumes according to, um, to the league tables. If you look at our Antipodes, they rank very highly in fact first versus most of the Morningstar medalists in the value category. And if you look at Hyperion, not only are they first in the growth style, but their first over one, three, and five years versus all retail global equity funds. Now, some of our audience members asked, why do we have resolution capital being showcased today? And the primary reason is that Morningstar agreed to host the panel for us. And Morningstar considers GREITs as part of an overall global equities allocation. So again, we are truly fortunate to have Andrew Parsons again, who will be putting up a strong case on why GREITs offer a compelling opportunity for global equity portfolio allocations. Now, uh, besides the questions around value style and growth style investing, perhaps more top of mind are issues such as COVID-19 impact on global markets, rising or declining ge um, geopolitical risks, including the upcoming US elections, or perhaps how global property is surviving or even thriving in the new economic world. So uh, in a moment, our managers will address all these issues and more during their presentations. But following on, we are delighted to have Morningstar, one of Australia's and indeed the world's leading research companies, um, host a very comprehensive Q&A session. Um, from previous sessions that we hosted, please stick around. Morningstar has got some very good insights to share with you and the panel session proves to be a cracker. Before we start, a bit of housekeeping. By now, you should all be very well versed on the ON24 platform. It's highly customizable. Please feel free to uh, play around with the features. You can download all the presentation material. Um, if you're interested in getting your uh, CPD hours, you can uh, click on the CPD hours link 
and start that process today. Okay, first up, you're going to hear from Antipodes on global investing. Antipodes was established in 2015, and the team has grown to encompass over 25 investment professionals with offices in London and in Sydney. Antipodes manages a concentrated benchmark unaware portfolio that aims to outperform the global equity index at lower levels of risk, thereby delivering investors a smoother investment journey. Importantly, Antipodes approach investing from a pragmatic value perspective. Whilst a traditional value manager may dogmatically stick with low multiple stocks, and of course they look for a mean reversion, Antipodes recognises that this approach may miss structural changes in industries. Therefore, the team at Antipodes look for great businesses at attractive valuations. In fact, Antipodes uses multiple levers, such as investing long, employ shorting, and they use active currency management to generate absolute returns in excess of the benchmark, and of course, looking to deliver lower risk. This approach has seen Antipodes generate best-in-class performance relative to other value style managers in Australia. And with that, I would like to welcome um, Jacob Mitchell, the CIO. Jacob has an impressive career track record of generating strong alpha for investors. So I'm going to hand over to you, Jacob. Welcome. Thanks, Ramsey. And welcome, everyone. Let's, uh, let's jump straight in. And uh, the first slide we have here is really a, a great way to showcase, we think anyway, what has been going on in markets over a very, very long period of time. The market has become uh, very narrow and you can see that in the yellow line, which is measuring market cap concentration, which now over a 30 year period is the most extreme it has ever been. At the same time, the breadth of the market in terms of the number of stocks that are outperforming is very, very low. And the light blue line there captures the performance of, very importantly, sector neutral value stocks. So the value factor in a, measured in a sector neutral basis. So we're eliminating the biases of uh, you know, value today being dominated by energy and financials or in 2000 where the expensive leg of value was dominated by internet stocks. So it gives you a sense of the cycles that value goes through. Now some are short and sharp as we saw in 15 and 16 and others tend to be very long. Um, so we'll examine why we have these different outcomes. So when you look at our next slide, we're, we're really examining you know, it, whether growth stocks actually are expensive. You know, have we seen such an outperformance of growth? And uh, you know, this has been ha happening over a period of, of the last decade where we've had open-ended QE. Secular winners have become, you know, have been outperforming. And you know, since, uh, let's call it December to 2018, when the Fed blinked and pivoted, uh, you know, that outperformance has accelerated. And COVID was really the final, uh, let's call it, application of the steroids. Uh, with many of those, uh, let's call it e-commerce stocks or cloud um, computing stocks, which are doing very well, you know, we almost accelerated the adoption of some of these business models. Um, so the collapse in low multiple versus high multiple um, is depicted on that chart. But it's, let's understand that these stocks are getting more expensive. Their share prices are going up faster than their earnings, and they're now roughly two standard deviations expensive. Now. On the other hand, value is two, more than two standard deviations cheap. Now, what does that mean? It really means there's extraordinarily high level of valuation dispersion in the market today. So what would be the precondition for, for tightening that up? Why would PE multiples mean revert? Why would some of the high PE stocks potentially underperform? Maybe they're growth traps. They could be great businesses. But similar to uh, Cisco and Microsoft in 2000, they kept growing, but they ended up on lower multiples. So they weren't great investments. Great businesses, not great investments. On the other hand, what could change the dynamic for the losers? Um, well, clearly, you know, in the 15 and 16 rebound in traditional value, it was driven by a rebound in the economy. So we would need to see some ongoing reopening. So let's look at the reopening scorecard. Uh, China is leading the way where measuring hotel occupancies, you're now back to a pre-COVID level. Importantly, it's more than just land travel. We, we have air travel in China. We have 10, more than 10 million uh, passenger movements, domestic passenger movements per week. 
that's only very slightly below the pre-COVID level. So China has effectively reopened its economy without a vaccine. Australia, as you know, we still have borders closed and Europe and the US seem to be somewhere in between, but with basically a pathway to reopen. And they don't look like they're in any mood to go back into a hard lockdown. So it's one thing for politicians to say it's okay to go out. It's another thing for consumers to change behavior. And some behaviors are gonna stay permanently changed. So vaccines, I think are important. Uh, we think they come in two waves. I think the first generation we will start to see the results of phase three uh, tests very soon by the end of the year, led by Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca. Uh, look, we think these, these first generation vaccines will go to the, the first responders, healthcare workers, uh, the extremely vulnerable, for example, the elder, elderly, and then um, maybe this, the, let's call it the super spreaders, the, the college age kids. The, the second generation won't become, will be more of a traditional, so let's call it antibody approach, and they are likely to become available in a mass sense, um, you know, in the second half of next year. So the pathway to a vaccine is important. We think uh, there's enough money being thrown at the issue such that there will be success. Um, so whilst we're waiting for vaccines and, you know, we have this sort of, um, you know, let's call it, you know, step, two steps forward, one step back approach to opening up the economy. Um, you know, we, 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 we need income stimulus and let's face it, um, at least in the West. Um, China, you know, is there and you can see that China has used very little income or investment stimulus to stabilise the economy. And then at the other extreme, you have the US, which has used an extraordinarily high level of fiscal income stimulus to achieve a rebound in the economy. So it's important for investors to consider the longer term implications of the Fed becoming very close to the US Treasury. Independence is very, Fed independence is very much a question mark today. Um, we have relatively open-ended fiscal deficits being actively monetized by the Fed. Um, and just remember coming into COVID when the economy, US economy was running hot, the fiscal deficit was at 4%. Um, it's likely to, we think, peak at in excess of 20%. And then it's a question of how they bring it under control. So keep an eye on the dollar in our funds. We uh, certainly underweight the US dollar because we think in the longer term, it will weaken relative to, um, relative to the rest of the world. So back to China where, you know, we've opened up the economy without a vaccine. Uh, you know, we see two broad opportunities across the consumer mix. You have on the left of the bar bill, you know, roughly a billion uh, people who are living in areas of China, uh, let's call it lower tier cities and, and rural areas where GDP per capita is roughly $5,000. And you know, that's double the level you have in India. And it's really quite interesting. At that level, you start to see discretionary spending start to rise as a percentage of total household spend. There's opportunities in that bucket. At the right hand of the barbell, you have the you know, richer part of China tending to be on the coastal areas or you know, let's call it uh, some of the higher tier cities. GDP per capita is three times higher, it's growing faster. It's growing at about 15% compounding. And the consumers here are all about premiumization. Now there's one company in China that really services both of those big consumer groups, the billion on the left, and let's call it the roughly 340 million on the right, and that's Alibaba. So why do we think Alibaba is a pragmatic value opportunity? Well, it really comes down to the price you're paying for the resilience of the business and the level of growth that you are getting. Um, E-commerce has, or retail, modern retail has developed in China in a very different way to the US. And that's important to understand. Um, E-commerce is already at a 25% penetration in China and Alibaba accounts for roughly 60% of that. So Alibaba is roughly 14 times larger than the largest offline retailer. So it's, it's basically the dominant retailer in China. 
Secondly, it is a platform which we think has a lot of latent pricing power. The average um, take rate, which is the percentage of the sale that ends up in Alibaba's uh, revenue line, is roughly 4%. It's quite low for a dominant platform. You know, in other parts of the world, those take rates are you know, averaging roughly 15%. So we think a lot of pricing power. Um, and if you think, well, but you're telling a story of a company that's already dominant, and you're telling a story about a company where, and an economy where already a quarter, quarter of all retailers online, where is the growth gonna come from? Well, the big category which hasn't shifted online is fresh grocery. Now, fresh grocery in China is dominated still by wet markets. Now, we know, you know the speculation of where COVID originated. Clearly, it's gonna be a priority of the government over time to modernize that part of the food supply chain. So we think there's a great opportunity. That market alone is roughly in size, 50%, very little is online and it's equivalent to 50% of the total e-commerce market today. So great opportunity to continue growing. Uh, look, Yum China uh, is the dominant quick serve restaurant in China. It has the, both the KFC and the Pizza Hut brands. Uh, you know, it's a, a really an interesting opportunity to participate in long-term growth where COVID has given you the opportunity to enter at a very attractive valuation. So all around the world, restaurants have been hit hard. The restaurants that have, by lockdown, the restaurants that have a quite developed digital and delivery um, app, which is really what Yum China has in KFC, have done much better. And not only is it a, a rebound opportunity, but it is also a, an opportunity to partic participate in a very a secular shift. Uh, only 5% uh, of all restaurant sales in China happen in a modern chain uh, setting. That number is over 50% in the US, and we expect China to modernize in a similar way. And Yum is the dominant player that will drive, drive that ongoing um, upgrade. Ping An is a stock we've had in the portfolio for, for some time. Um, life insurance in China is a, an opportunity, um, is really in the early stages. It's an underpenetrated category. There is a need for a safety net. And um, when you look at premium to GDP in China, it's even lower than markets like India and Indonesia. Uh, so you're, really, you're playing in that sort of wealthier bucket but it's a structural growth opportunity on a multiple, a sub 10 multiple. So very interesting. So let's switch focus to the Western reopening opportunity. You know, this is, the, this is really stocks that are in parts of the market that are hugely neglected today. Uh, we have examples here on the slide of financials, one of the world's great um, auto companies, VW, uh, very neglected long way below the trend valuations. And it's not a short term opportunity in terms of just getting a bounce because of reopening. We think these are longer term structural winners in their category, which are not being disrupted. Capital One dominating in US credit cards, ING in Northern European mortgages. Um, and, you know, all the focus on Tesla today, um, you know, what the market may be missing in VW is that you really, because of diesel gate, um, VW had to pivot to the early adoption of EV drivetrains and through the MEB platform, uh, where they're basically right, rolling out a, a platform across multiple brands um, to get scale economics. They've really gone all in on EVs, and we think they could be the largest manufacturer of EVs within the next couple of years. Um, so you get along with that, obviously some great luxury brands in the case of Audi and Porsche, um, and at a multiple that is extraordinarily cheap, you know, at a, at a roughly a 30% discount to book, um, we think on a six times earnings power type multiple. Um, Coca-Cola clearly doesn't need any introduction. Um, Coke, once again, has been hit hard. They're on, very large on-premise business because they control the supply chain right down to the fridge or the shelf that they're stocking. Uh, we think it is a very efficient distribution and branding platform, which gives them pricing power. But it also means they've been hit hard by COVID. So COVID's giving you a short-term setback, an opportunity to buy a great long-term opportunity. Now, 
opening up as one, one cluster or a couple of a group of clusters in the portfolio that we describe as stage two. The stage two, the stage three opportunities are really in where, what, what we think is coming next, which is the fact that governments with this backdrop of populism or polarization, they understand that eventually they run out of fiscal bullets for income and they need to you know, kickstart an investment cycle. The European Union really has had this investment cycle sitting on the shelf for some time. It's called the, you know, the, the Green New Deal and it's, it's sort of anchored by the emission trading system that's been in place for some time. So we think it's the emergence of a, a virtuous cycle of investment um, and how does that work? Well, what the ETS encourages is the decarbonisation of the power sector. And as the carbon price goes higher and that decarbonisation uh, takes place, you, you're basically generating revenues for governments. Governments can then use those revenues to subsidise the parts of the economy that are not covered by the ETS, which is transport, so the adoption of EVs, or in the house or office using uh, electric power rather than gas for heating. So this feeds back into demand for, for electric power. So we see an emerging super cycle. If Europe is to deliver its uh, targets, 2030 targets, the demand for electric power in Europe will grow some you know, 37%. That is massive. It requires investment in infrastructure. So we think the total investment cycle, which is just under 4 trillion euros, spread over two years, 10 years, uh, would be the equivalent of a 2% permanent increase in investment to GDP in that ratio over 10 years. So you need to be in companies which are going to benefit, are actually going to be doing the upgrade on the grid, EDF, or providing the materials for that upgrade in the case of Norsk Hydro, which is a um, produces aluminium, but from hydroelectricity, and then Siemens, which covers most of the, uh, let's call it, in terms of uh, the investment that you need to make in the grid. Now, this type of cycle is very different to the one that we've been experiencing. And uh, if you look at um, some of the, you know, the risks that we see in the market, you know, there's clearly going to be permanent changes. And these are not risks, it's just a recognition that, you know, supply chains, the ongoing conflict between the US and China, relocalization of supply chains, probably the fact that office demand doesn't normalize. And look, some of the, you know, in, in the case of travel and retail, you know, you really want to be backing omni-channel winners. The risks to recovery, um, we've already seen the US pull back on some of the income stimulus uh, from $600 a week to $400 a week, and that will soon run out. The US, similar to Europe, needs to find an investment stimulus plan. Now, there's not a lot of consensus between Republicans and Democrats on what that might take. We still, we have some of the, let's call it the lower income groups that have been hit hardest by COVID. And, you know, there'll be more focus going forward on minimum wage, potential social wage, and the, you know, the elephant in the room, how do we bring some of these fiscal deficits under control and does that result in currency devaluation and inflation? The US tech rivalry is not going away. The overview of the portfolio, um, the stage one winners, the secular growers that have benefited from COVID, it's time to start pivoting away from some of those more expensive names into the cheaper names in the stage two and stage three buckets. So when you look at the portfolio, you know, we have, as a pragmatic value manager, we certainly have uh, found more value in the better quality global cyclicals. You can see there on the slide, um, it's not exactly clear due to the colors, but our long book has certainly been underweight that sector, but it's, the global defensives, we've been underweight, we've been overweight the cyclicals. Now, we would argue that's justified by the very different valuations you're paying for those companies. And then if you look at, from a geographic, if you look at the more domestically oriented part of the markets, the US is certainly a lot more expensive than the rest of the world. And that also has been a headwind for our performance. So 
as a pragmatic value manager, yes, we have underperformed slightly the ACWI index uh, through time. We have, out, however, uh, outperformed the, let's call it the value benchmark and uh, against the benchmark and we, you know, obviously against the peer group, as you can see on the chart. Look, the portfolio remains a steadfastly pragmatic value portfolio, as you can see here on the slide. Our average investment is on a PE of 15 times, which makes it a 65th percentile stock cheap, as in lower multiple. But we're getting a company that is an above, above average grower and a better quality uh, in terms of its balance sheet than the market. So we, we think we, in summary, we have a market set up where, uh, you know, we've had winners in the cloud, in the internet space, Many of that, that's those secular trends are, are starting to mature. The valuations you're paying for exposure to those trends are certainly elevated. And we see the beginning of investment cycles, which could be very physical, very labor and capital intensive. Similar to 2000, when the dot-com bubble peaked and the, and the resources super cycle started, you can get a changing of the guard. And we think headwinds for the portfolio in terms of being underweight growth and defensives as a sector and underweight the US can actually turn into tailwinds for our portfolio. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jacob, for those valuable insights as always. Um, Jacob will be back uh, for the Morning Star Q&A session, so please stay um, tuned in. Also, please submit your questions. We do have a bunch of analysts and distribution folks um, that are uh, on deck trying to answer all your questions as we go along. Um, as mentioned yesterday, Antipodes are also participating in this year's Portfolio Construction Forum. So if you enjoyed hearing from Jacob and you want to hear more about asset allocation, he will be sitting on an asset allocation panel at the PCF. The PCF will be hosted on the 30th of September and 1st of October. And uh, as mentioned yesterday, Pinnacle has some limited complimentary passes to the event. And it is on a first in first um, case basis. So please contact your Pinnacle uh, director. And if there's any passes remaining, we're more than happy to invite you along to that event. We'll take a 30 second, minute, uh, 30 second break just to get our next presenter into the studio. Thank you. Next up, we're going to change focus from looking at global value-based investing to looking at global growth-based investing with Hyperion. By way of background, Hyperion have a 20-year track record in managing equity portfolios. Hyperion have shown during COVID-19 market meltdown and in other crises, such as coming through the GFC, that not only can they protect portfolios in falling markets, but also strongly outperforming markets over the long term. So what makes Hyperion different? Hyperion manages a concentrated, benchmark unaware portfolio that only invests in the highest quality businesses. Everyone says that they invest in high quality businesses, but how do they define quality? Well, Hyperion defines quality stocks as those with a high return on capital, low debt, and businesses that can deliver highly predictable earning streams in both up and down markets and through strong competitive advantages. So, so companies essentially have wide moats. With that, I would like to introduce Hyperion's chairman, Tim Samway. 
Tim has been involved with Hyperion, um, Hyperion since its inception, and he'll take you through all the risks they see in the market and who will be the winners going forward. Tim, I'd like to welcome you to the summit this year. Thank you very much, Ramson. Um, I'm going to go through the biggest risks in, uh, in global equity portfolios today. Um, buckle in, it's going to be, I've got to cover a lot in 15 minutes, so I may not take a breath until I get to the end. So here are just a few of the risks that we see. Um, I'll let you read them, um, I'm not going to go through them. Um, I'm sure we could actually find act many more than the ones above. Um, some, like these highlighted in green, are already with us, understood and, uh, and providing reasonably obvious um, investment opportunities. And some, such as these that I've highlighted in red, are just possible threats and, and we'd argue some like the risk of rising interest rates are actually unlikely to eventuate in the next 10 years. But one, identified by the Hyperion investment team, is sitting there in plain sight and not well understood. So lower global GDP growth has actually been identified in a recent Hyperion white paper by Mark Arnold and Jason Orthman, um, who are on our team, um, CIO and Deputy CIO, as a substantial risk to global investors. Um, global investors are overexposed to thousands of poor quality companies from which they will make poor future returns while waiting for a mean reversion. So the majority of companies actually rely on high economic growth to prosper. Their sales growth, their earnings growth, and their share price actually depends upon it. But the effect of a slow de uh, de deterioration in GDP growth on share prices has been masked by falling interest rates which have re-rated all businesses as earnings have stagnated. Um, the factors that drove economic growth po post-World War II, such as uh, population growth, the unfettered use of uh, fossil fuels, low levels of business disruption, rising workforce participation rates of women, that these things have either reversed or peaked. Um, interest rates bottomed out post the GFC, so there's actually um, limited further interest rate driven re-rating uh, possible. And as a result, you have 10 years post the GFC where average businesses have struggled. So the bad news is there's no joy in sight for those businesses. GDP growth will stay low, as will interest rates, as will inflation. Modern, information-driven businesses not reliant on GDP growth are either expanding their addressable markets or even taking market share, or sometimes they're doing both. That is delivering overall addressable market growth and actually market share growth. So a, a larger slice, if you like, of a bigger pie. And they're driving substantial earnings growth in the absence of economic growth. So this is a chart of US stock market returns by each decade over the last 120 years, split into returns from dividends in blue, price earnings ratio changes in red, and earnings growth in green. And in recent years, the reduction in, in dividend component is evident looking at those last couple of boxes. Um, the 80s and the 90s circled here in red were the years of the falling interest rates, when economic growth, while declining, still drove sales growth uh, for average businesses. The share prices of average businesses actually benefited from those re-ratings. The period post-GFC, which I've circled there in green, which saw the rise of modern businesses has been an earnings story, but the earnings have accrued to a small subset of global innovators and disruptors. So power law distributions exist in this internet enabled world. Um, another way of expressing power law is the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule. A small number of companies make most of the money. This chart shows the return on equity for the stocks in the MISCI world uh, since the 1980s divided by decile. So prior to the internet, disruption levels were low and the relative profitability of most businesses was stable. The relationship changed in the 1990s with the advent of the internet. In an internet enabled world where global internet platforms have strong value propositions, power law distributions have moved, to, uh, have moved from being regionally based to globally based. As a result, it's become a globalized winner takes all or at least winner takes most market. And this has increased market share shifts. The strongest platforms with global scale win most customers and disrupt the old world regional competitors. The strong get stronger in an internet enabled globalized world and the strong take market share from the weak. This means lower margins and lower sales for most businesses, which are actually represented here by all those lower deciles on this chart. And, and of course, particularly the lower decile, the, the bottom decile. Um, these structural winners like Alphabet, Amazon and Facebook w weren't obvious at the time we purchased them back in 2014. But of course, now they're obvious in hindsight and, and managers are buying them. 
These stocks were well covered and anyone could have purchased these businesses, but incumbent managers have only begun to drift towards these names in the last couple of years. And why is that? Well, we think it's this focus on short-term metrics, price earnings, price book, enterprise value to sales, which are at best shortcuts with limited value. If you've looked at the PE ratio to provide an insight on purchase, you are actually wasting your time as the very positive to negative changes in ratings over time, and I've highlighted here in red, the PE of Amazon at 117 times you can see on that chart, or MasterCard at 27 times back in 2014, told you actually little about how much you could make from these businesses in the long term. But a good look at their customer value propositions, and particularly their potential market share changes, were much more instructive. Here's a domestic example that you'd, you'd all know. REA has been a hundred bagger for Hyperion. It's always look expensive on short-term metrics. Uh, many years back, I was uh, at a, a kid's soccer match uh, and another fund manager told me that at $20 a share, REA was his most obvious short. Uh, the comment was, it's just a website, it's not a business. Well, how's that turned out? The business has had a strong and sustainable value proposition that's allowed it to take significant market share in a large addressable market. The relationship between sales per share, earnings per share and share price has actually been tight over the long term. This chart illustrates that in the long run, it's the sustainable growth in the business earnings per share and sales per share that actually determine the share price performance. Now you might say, well, like this is obvious. Just follow the increase in sales per share and the earnings per share and the price will follow. But what if you were building market share and the earnings lags that, that the earnings that actually lag that growth. Well, this is the same chart for Amazon. So double digit sales growth from market share gains in retail, plus innovative innovation leading to the creation of AWS, Amazon Web Services, and the cloud have driven the superior share price returns. But you have to look at the free cash flow rather than the earnings to understand how it's been able to fund its growth through producing growing positive free cash flows over the past 23 years. Again, if your main criteria for investing was a low price earnings ratio, you would have actually missed 37% compound share price growth over the past 23, 23 years versus 5% uh, for the Miski world, that's per annum. And, and if you'd just been following the earnings, you'd have also missed the boat, as you can see in this chart. So using Amazon, let's look at some detail around market share. So the orange line on this graph is the best estimate of historical market shares for Amazon in e-commerce retail in the US, that's our estimates. The orange line has risen strongly in the last five years. Right now, there's uh, roughly $5 trillion US dollars in retail sales in the US. Um, the online component is only 600 billion. Um, so that's an e-commerce penetration of around 11%. But in China, as, uh, as Jacob's just noted, the penetration of, of, of e-commerce in retail is 25%. So you can draw your own conclusions about how far Amazon market share could rise from here. In any case, uh, the number is substantial. Um, the data uh, you see here is at December 2019, but with COVID and everybody moving online, we actually expect the yearly penetration to be much higher when reported early next year. The blue line is the historical AWS share of the cloud market with Microsoft, Google and Alibaba, the other major players. Well, AWS are starting to lose a bit of share um, as the other cloud companies take some share, but cloud computing comprising infrastructure and platform as a service is growing very strongly, most recently at a five year compound average growth rate of 45%. So it doesn't take long for the market to become a trillion dollar market given that the existing player's total revenue is around 86 billion. So you can see the potential for all the major players in this market. You don't need to steal market share when the total addressable market is so large and the four winners will take most. This is a chart of Tesla. Vehicle deliveries moved to Tesla, another portfolio holding. The estimates actually here are Teslas um, and they're currently producing a run rate of 500,000 vehicles a year rising to about 3 million a year in no time at all. So the vehicle sales growth story is actually a good story in itself. It's, it's actually even better when you look at what's happened to the rest of the car market. So to June this year, there's been 28 consecutive months of deterioration in global new car sales, while Tesla has substantially increased delivery in sales. But we've never been interested in just another car company. Um, 
When they get to a production of, say, 3 million cars a year, and that's not that far out, this results in the addition of tens of thousands of megawatts of battery storage per year sitting in cars in consumer garages. Now, to put this in perspective, a Raring power station on Lake Macquarie, just north of where we are here, is rated at 2,900 megawatts and is the largest in Australia. So we're talking about Tesla adding multiple Araring stations per year in storage to garages. So with Tesla Auto Bit of Software, the storage will be available eventually to the grid as a virtual power plant and can offer services to the energy market such as frequency regulation, grid support, reserve capacity and time shifting, just to name four of over 18 services that battery, you can use with battery storage. So, and if, if you don't know what frequency regulation is for Tesla, then Tesla is just a speculative card bet, and, and I understand that. Um, but if you, put, and if you put it to most people, I suspect that they don't really understand the revenue that Tesla could earn from all of these services. So the substantial opportunity for Tesla is to actually dominate that virtual power plant and energy storage market through a first mover advantage. Um, and that's just missing from most sell side an analysis at the moment. So Tesla, as I said, is a major holding in the, in the global fund. And the pie for Tesla is enormous. There are multiple slices for them to compete for. There's the global energy market at $11.1 .1 trillion that's yet to be disrupted at all. And then there's the global ride sharing addressable market at 5.7 trillion, plus the traditional auto market at 3.1 trillion. So um, Tesla has lead offerings in two of these and has signaled its intention to enter the ride sharing market once it perfects autonomous vehicles. But it's only the opportunity in the traditional uh, auto market that's th that the stock market is currently considering, not the whole pie. So finally, Square is taking the card terminal and the person-to-person -person cash transaction market by storm. They produce those small white POS uh, card terminals and they have a P2P cash app uh, somewhat similar to Apple Pay and PayPal's Venmo, which is not available here in Australia yet. The total addressable market is $140 billion and they currently have less than 3% penetration. This chart of its revenue growth versus traditional payments companies Visa and MasterCard, shown here in grey and blue, show how Square can convert a compelling offering to small bricks and mortar retail outlets and consumers into a much larger share of this $140 billion market. It's branched into other offerings to shops, including payroll, staff management, online retail engines, and offerings to uh, consumers, such as the opportunity to buy stocks and even Bitcoin, uh, trade Bitcoin through the app. It's no wonder the stock's been on a tear since uh, March, as consumers stopped using cash and started tapping cards and phones to pay for goods and services. And, and we don't see that trend reversing. These three companies, Tesla, Square and Amazon, make up about 30% of the Hyperion global portfolio. And last year, the big holdings were in Facebook and Al Alphabet, so it's not unusual for us to have concentration like that. We've built our 20-year plus track record as the number one uh, manager in equities on concentration just like this. Because we know that equity returns are always driven by a number of, uh, just a narrow number of market leaders. Research uh, that I put here released in 2018 shows that the best performing 4% of US listed companies explain the entire net gain for the US stock market since 1926 as other stocks collectively match the return from treasury bills. So this chart highlights that all the companies right of that dotted line added virtually no value. Power law relationships are also evident in fund manager portfolios. Well, at least they should be. The best stock picks usually provide outside uh, stock returns, outside stock returns, and therefore, to maximise the overall portfolio return, you should supersize the holding in those high conviction stocks. So, a word of caution about applying these rules widely. Not all growth stocks are like these, and I'd probably go further to say that most aren't. There are just a few where we can draw a line from the market share gains to future earnings with a clear execution path that we can monitor with good confidence. What we are very confident about is that global growth has slowed and it's not going to change in a hurry. And while there might be some short-term junk or value rallies, they're unlikely to be persistent. The modern innovative businesses taking share are long-term winners and many market participants avoid them because of short-term metrics. And if you're going to pick winners, you should concentrate in them. 
It's worked for 100 years. And to take advantage of short-term corrections like the one we're just seeing now to improve your entry point to the Hyperion Global Growth Companies Fund. If you want to read a bit more on this, there are a bunch of white papers on our website. I refer them, you, know, you to them. Good morning. Tim, thank you so much for another excellent presentation. That 4% um, number is a scary number. It's no longer 2080, it's actually 4% of stocks explaining everything in terms of returns. Um, there's more food for thought for you after two sessions this morning in terms of um, how you're thinking about your global portfolio allocations. We are going to take a 30 second break to bring in our next presenter, but I will just simply quickly remind you, I've mentioned the uh, Portfolio Construction Forum. Well, for those of you that are interested in hearing more about Hyperion, um, Hyperion will also be presenting at this year's uh, Strategies Conference where Hyperion's um, uh, Managing Director and the Chief Investment Officer, Mark Arnold, and Jason Orthman, the Deputy CIO, will be sharing some of their secret sauce of how they're generating these uh, returns at that conference. Uh, please get in touch with the uh, Pinnacle uh, Director of Distribution or a contact at Pinnacle, and we can see if there's any more remaining um, complimentary passes for you to attend that event. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Thank you. Welcome back everyone. Last but not least, we turn to Resolution Capital's presentation. Australians love property, but how many understand the benefits of global property investing and what it can bring to your investment portfolio? Investing in global property portfolio will provide investors with access to sectors and markets generally not available here in Australia. But what's even more attractive is that you will get higher income than investing in just global equities. Resolution Capital is Australia's leading GREITS fund manager, and the team, similar to Antipodes and Hyperion, also adopts an unconstrained approach to investing. Last year, Morningstar termed Resolution Capital as the paragon of investing in global property. This year, they stated in their research report released a few weeks ago that they are simply the best. With that, it's a great, um, with that, it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome the man who really needs no introduction, Andrew Parsons gives amazing presentations, and I'm going to hand over to you, Andrew, to take us through G Reads. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks, Ramson. That uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I feel very humbled. Thank you. Uh, it's very disappointing that uh, we can't be together to present today, but uh, we'll uh, try this uh, uh, means of uh, communicating what we think to be uh, still one of the great uh, areas of uh, the investment uh, opportunity set, and that is global listed real estate. Now, with Resolution Capital, we've been investing in real estate for over 25 years and investing in global real estate now for uh, near on 15 years. And you can see from the table in front of you that uh, our performance over the long term uh, has been, we think, uh, uh, pretty reasonable um, in terms of generating an absolute return that's greater than the rate of inflation. Now, we're not an absolute return investor, but we're certainly not a benchmark investor. We are investing in select global real estate that we think provides investors with the opportunity to have access to some of the world's best real estate that happens to be listed. We haven't replicated an index. 
Uh, we've never frozen redemptions on any of our strategies for 25 years in investing in real estate. And it's also fair to say that we didn't predict a number of issues that have come to challenge us over the years. What we do believe is that there is a real estate cycle and that we will be tested periodically by unexpected events. So what we try to do is to look through the long term, to the long term, to look for basically pricing power, whereby we believe landlords have the opportunity to increase their income streams and particularly their cash flows at least the great, uh, rate of, uh, greater than the rate of inflation that therefore enables investors to generate uh, long-term term wealth creation. Clearly, the last 12 or six, um, uh, nine months has been a particularly challenging period. What we've seen uh, because of COVID is huge uncertainty over uh, the traditional uh, uh, rent structure. What investors have to remember is that a lease contract is a legally binding contract. There is no out clauses for pandemics in 99.99% of leases. Tenants are obligated to pay rents. Now, when you consider that uh, for an order for a business uh, to pay uh, their banks, uh, to pay dividends to their shareholders, they need to operate in space typically. And to operate in space typically, they need to pay their rent. So in some shape or form, landlords in fact, quite often are effectively a senior creditor. Now, we also recognise that this has been an exceptional period and that landlords have both to be pragmatic, but also to be socially responsible. And what we've seen is leadership in that area in the listed market. REIT management have worked with tenants to help them through these challenging times. There's been a range of different uh, means to be able to assist tenants to continue on uh, in business, as, including businesses as well as individuals. But clearly with COVID, there have been some very significant consequences. What's most concerning is the impact of, uh, of economic contraction. Economic contraction typically means a reduction in tenant demand. And that to us is the most significant uh, outcome of what we're seeing. There's clearly been disruption to operations and disruption to cash flows. What we believe is most important is to understand how that has therefore uh, uh, affected the underlying solvency of the businesses and the tenants. Clearly we've seen uh, a number of tenants using this as an opportunity, we think quite unfairly and in some cases unethically, because what they're doing is actually claiming unfairly business disruption to be able to try to negotiate their position uh, for better leases. Now I won't name names, but clearly there's been a number of retailers in this country that we think uh, have overplayed their hand uh, but in fact, it is all part of the ongoing war between landlords and tenants. The most important issue that we've seen has been that there has been an acceleration of trends that were already, uh, in fact, visible in the lead up to COVID. And that is clearly in the area of digitisation and e-commerce. And what we can see on the right is that those areas which have, been, uh, have benefited most through this environment have been those that were already doing well in the lead up and they being, as I say, data centres, uh, logistics, uh, as well as residential and self-storage. The areas which have been impacted most have clearly have been retail and office. And both of those areas have really been under enormous pressure in the last decade because of changing the changing nature of business. So how are we positioned today? Uh, today, we believe in this uh, period, diver quality diversification uh, serves us well. Now, what we mean by that is having to us the leaders in various areas of the real estate market that we think are going to continue to be able to generate strong cash flow over the long term. But it's clear that we do believe that the digitisation and e-commerce story has some way to go. Residential is also a very important part of our portfolio being basic shelter. But in fact, it gets more interesting than that. There's clearly a number of different ways to play the global listed real estate market. We're talking about single family homes, apartments, student housing, and manufactured home communities. But we also do have some retail because we do think retail does serve a purpose, particularly mission critical retail, such as restaurants, and also select malls. 
where omni-channel, as you've heard other speakers uh, talk about, uh, is clearly a way for the most effective way to do business in uh, uh, producing and selling, distributing goods and services. In relation to healthcare, we have what we think to be an exceptional uh, exposure to areas of the health industry that are growing, uh, uh, in, including GP clinics, life science and medical office buildings, otherwise known as MOBs. Office, it's clearly going to be a challenging period for office as we come to terms with a different way that we work in the short term and the longer term consequences. But for us, the real consequence is the economic contraction which results in a contraction in office demand. That to us is the most challenging uh, situation. And what we're seeing today is vacancy rates are in fact increasing. Already in Sydney, for example, vacancy rates have moved from about mid fours, four and a half percent, to close to 7% in a very short period of time and supply is still coming through. So to us, that's the critical issue. Now, what this highlights to us is an enormous range of different opportunities that frankly many institutional institutions struggle to get through unlisted means. And you'll find that most institutions have the majority of their exposures to traditional areas such as retail and office. And we believe those exposures are, are overvalued, continue to be overvalued, and there is going to be a long draw out, drawn out process of devaluation and pressure on, on liquidity. But let's look at the quality of our portfolio in terms of as measured by uh, their uh, ability to pay dividends. Not just pay dividends, but in fact to grow dividends. And what you can see there from our top 10 positions, which is almost 50% of the portfolio, you can see that in fact, in most cases, distributions are growing, are expected to grow in the current and future years in nine out of our 10 top positions. And clearly the dividends are well covered by earnings. The other feature is that we do have a reasonable amount of geographic diversification. Clearly there is a high degree of exposure to the US, but there is also good exposure to other outstanding uh, real estate markets around the world. What we also want to try to do is highlight the opportunity set so that people understand the underlying real estate in which we're investing. Some of the best real estate can be found in, for example, a stock called Alexandria. Alexandria owns life science clusters uh, in North America. These are typically adjacent to leading academic institutions. They're involved in a lab space research. And that's incredibly important, obviously, in the COVID world, where a number of tenants uh, in the Alexandria portfolio are conducting research into COVID. Now, no need to worry if they do hopefully come up with a vaccine. There's plenty of other research projects for them to carry on with. And the great thing is these are long-term research pro projects. So regardless of the economic circumstances, these are well-funded long-term research programs that the tenants continue to operate. The other great thing about that story, or this story, is that the leases are what is what's called triple net. Now, as most of us who know, own homes uh, know that uh, we have enormous amounts of ongoing bills to pay in maintaining a house to its uh, a high, high quality uh, living standard. And it's the same with commercial real estate. Tenants expect buildings to be constantly kept up to date. And that's ex escape cash flow. In the case of Alexandria, most of their tenants are what's called triple net. That means that the tenant is responsible for the upkeep of the property. So when they pay the landlord the rent, it's a true cash flow rent. And we're seeing very strong growth in that cash flow and we expect that to continue for the next three to five years. Another opportunity that we have seen emerge from COVID has been uh, American campus community, student housing accommodation. Clearly there has been disruption in this area, but we think this, the long-term story remains intact and that COVID is a temporary impact on that story. So we're very confident that students will return and that this story will recover its ca uh, cash flow position. Venovia to us is an amazing story. The largest residential landlord in the world, four, over 400,000 apartments in terms of private sector, with a million occupants. Now, what we're seeing in Germany is a continuation of urbanisation and a structural undersupply. So there is a continuation of rental growth from this very diverse tenant mix of basic needs shelter 
of a portfolio that's trading below replacement cost. As you can see, around about $225,000 an apartment. So it's very good value. And of course, the big winner out of COVID has been the acceleration of data usage and stocks such as Equinix, which is the leader of network dense data centres. We think, again, this is an exceptional story whereby they effectively control what would have been termed uh, uh, telephone exchanges, where all the different internet con uh, connections take place in their facilities. So that to us is critical real estate infrastructure. And the growth outlook remains intact, if not reinforced. Cutting back to the real estate fundamentals, what we see is, again, a pretty moderate picture in terms of supply and occupancy surprisingly has remained relatively, uh, uh, occupancy has remained relatively elevated. So that to us means that the demand supply picture remains broadly in favour of landlords and that landlords in the, le in the REIT space, most importantly, have very strong balance sheets. Even with the recent devaluation pressure, the balance sheets remain very strong, which means they can take advantage of opportunities that arise in the current environment. So in terms of the outlook, look, I think it's fair to say it's ever uncertain. Uh, we certainly don't believe that uh, we're, we're through this. Uh, there's been obviously massive disruption in all sorts of ways, and we're not quite sure how it's going to play out. To us, the best thing to do is look for that quality real estate that we think will provide uh, long-term growth, uh, which will continue. But also as the chart uh, highlights to you, that there is in fact a good level of income that is derived from this asset class. So what we look for is functional, well-located real estate that's managed by outstanding teams that are able to extricate, uh, extract extra value from the real estate and have the balance sheets to be able to get through these sorts of uncertain periods. Thanks for your time. Andrew, thank you for once again sharing your deep insights with our audience. I promised you this morning that we'd have some uh, great content and I think every presenter has nailed it. And in a moment, we'll have all three presenters um, kick off our, um, our Q&A panel. Um, it is an absolute pleasure for me to actually um, introduce the host, um, Andrew Miles, uh, who's going to uh, host the panel. Andrew is a senior research analyst at Morningstar. I've had the pleasure of working within the same team as Andrew, and I know that he's actually prepared some great content to kick off the next session with some insights on, um, on market trends. So please stick around for that. Um, we're thrilled that Morningstar is hosting that session because Morningstar is a global company. They're in 28 countries. They've got 100 analysts around the globe. And all three of our managers are medalist rated, uh, rated managers. In the case of Resolution Capital, they're actually gold rated. So uh, I'm looking forward to that discussion. Um, for Andrew's bio, you can click on uh, the presenter's bios within the platform. So in the interest of time, I'll keep moving forward. Um, also, dear guests, if you haven't registered for our listed session, that um, will begin at quarter to 12. Um, it is important that you completely log out of this session when we finish the panel, and please log back in using the link that would be sitting in your inbox um, that is specifically for the LIC and the ETF session. So with that, uh, we're going to try to do a quick uh, setup of the, uh, the panel session, like an F1 pit crew. So give us about a minute and we'll start the next session. Thank you.
Hi there, and uh, welcome back, and thank you to Ramzan for that, that generous introduction. Um, as you said, I'm Andrew Miles from Morningstar, and I'm just going to run through a couple of quick um, observations from Morningstar, and then we're going to get into the, the meat of the, the subject, and we're going to speak to the panellists here who you uh, are already familiar with. So maybe just to start off um, with a quick disclaimer, um, and then going straight into this pie chart. So what we've done here is um, we've asked the... Um, advisor community, uh, or at least our advisor community, which asset class represents the best opportunity uh, for their clients. So we did this in June, so given how quickly the, move, the world's moving at the moment, it's a bit, bit dated, but as you can see there, that sort of yellowy, sandy colour um, is global equity. So that represents about 50%. So 50% of those advisors think that global equities is the best opportunity for their clients. Um, a sort of, sort of um, bluey colour is, is Aussie equities. And then there's a sort of smattering of, of other asset classes in there, so alternatives um, and a few others. So that's quite a good backdrop, really, for what we're going to be talking about today, because the three gentlemen next to me um, are global investors. So um, that's, that's a good start. The next slide, um, we're going to look at um, asset flows. So Morningstar collects a lot of uh, information about funds, and one of the metrics that we follow quite closely is asset flow. So you can see, um, broken down by asset class here, to June uh, 30th, um, the, the, the net flows, so this is yeah, obviously inflows minus outflows, over a 12 month period in blue, um, the sort of maroon color would be 24 months and then the yellow is 36 months. So um, it's not as positive a picture for um, equities, there's, there's been sort of modest outflows, um, but I would just put in a slight caveat that this doesn't um, capture institutional mandate wins and losses. So this is just for the sort of the wholesale uh, non-institutional market. So um, just bear that in mind. Um, the next chart um, is one that a couple of the speakers have referenced. Um, and what all this is showing is just the difference between value and growth. And we've just used two MSCI indices um, and their definitions of value and, gro value and growth. And what you can see, um, and this is going back since sort of the late 70s, um, is that it does seem to adopt a sort of cycle um, between value and growth. But what's really interesting, and um, Tim touched on it, is just how long value has underperformed growth and just how sort of protracted, and in the last couple of months, just how sort of severe that underperformance has been. So no doubt we'll get into that uh, in the panel discussion. Um, and then the final slide that I just wanted to touch on, um, and this is a bit of a busy slide, so just, just bear with me one second. So all we're doing here is we're taking the constituents of the MSCI World uh, Index, and we're plotting them, and on the x-axis, it's their PE ratio three years ago, and on the y-axis, it's their PE ratio at the end of July of this year. And so all this is really doing is showing, is the market, uh, sort of in aggregate getting more or less expensive and the two key numbers to focus on is that 47% and the 53% so that 47% is suggesting that 47% of the MSCI world is more expensive on a PE ratio basis than it was three years ago and 53% um, less expensive so I think that's quite interesting um, personally I would have expected that number of more expensive to be a lot higher but that gives you um, some context so that concludes um, just my opening comments. Um, and I think now it would be best to just go into um, the panel discussion. Um, and so you, you know the guests already, so I, I won't introduce them again, but, but maybe just to start with um, a question about time horizons and, and how you guys think about time horizons. So Tim, maybe we'll start with you. Hyperion sort of renowned for long-term structural growth companies and, and sort of backing, backing hopeful winners early. Um, how does this COVID environment alter, if at all, um, how you think about the long term and, and the short term? Yeah, so it, that's a good question. Um, look, we've always been long term. That's 24 years of that. Um, and if I had to, if I had to highlight just what this pandemic has done, is it's highlight, highlighted some of those long term tailwinds that have actually been exacerbated by the pandemic. So. You know, the one that jumps out at everybody, I guess, is that people just aren't carrying cash anymore. They're tapping their cards or they're swiping their phones. And that's really driven the take up of, 
of ca ca you know, cards and digital payments, and it's really benefited businesses like PayPal and Square and MasterCard and Visa. Um, people are all working from home. Like that was all happening, but now it's really been exacerbated and companies all around the world have had to quickly get ready for a world where people don't work in an office the same way that they did. So, you know, there's been some long-term trends that we've been counting on taking 10 years to roll out that have actually rolled out very, very quickly. Okay, great. Um, and Jacob, you've got a sort of few more sort of weapons in your arsenal to, um, to manage the long term and the short term. Um, yeah, how have you been sort of positioning portfolios um, given that you've got the ability to, to go long and short and, and a, a sort of few more levers in there? Yeah, look, there's obviously, um, you know, when real rates in the US are, are negative 1%, um, you know, you've got this combination of, as Tim, you know, the accelerant of COVID for a lot of the businesses that were already winning, they just kept, you know, they've won even more. And most of those are not going to give it back. But there's probably a a bunch of stocks in there that are genuine growth traps that are trading like bonds and with not a lot of thought going into the business model. Um, you know, narrow, a na very narrow SaaS company um, or an e-commerce company that may be benefited from a shot in the arm from COVID, but its market share is going to be lost to Amazon. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think in this environment, yes, the focus is always long term, but we think given P dispersion is so extreme you know, not a little extreme, it's extreme extreme, um, that there's going to be just as many growth traps as there are value traps. And as always, navigating that, regardless of what your toolkit is, it's the skill of the team and how those tools are deployed. Great. And Andrew, just, you know, you're, you've got a more sort of focused investment <laughs> universe um, than, than your colleagues next to you. Um, yeah, how have you been thinking about short-term challenges um, long-term trends, as the other guests have mentioned. Yeah, I guess, you know, what's, what's the definition of long-term and short-term? I mean, uh, you know, we're all quarterly uh, measured and why not five minutes and why not, you know, the last 60 seconds? So look, we all say we're long-term investors. So this is a, I think, a, a, I don't think any of us here are, are traders, but there's a difference between investment and speculating. And so we try to stay focused on investing. And if you look at the portfolio, it is about functional real estate. It is about relevant real estate. Um, we're not going to pick the turning points and the subtleties in the short term. Uh, all we know is that good real estate platforms, the management teams are exceptional, the balance sheets will take advantage of opportunities. So we just stay the course. You know, try and understand what's a change in direction and an acceleration in trend. That's the great challenge at the moment. To us, it's really just an acceleration of what we've already seen. Um, so for us, it's staying with our investments and not trying to speculate on the move to work from anywhere and all of the other sort of things that have come about or the talk that's come about because of COVID. That to us is the great challenge to cut out the noise, mm. differentiate work between what's noise and what's a Mack truck about to run you over. Okay, great. Um, one of the points that were made in the presentations and Timmy made some points about economic growth and, and things being quite challenged going forward um, from a growth perspective. And that has meant that you've avoided um, deliberately um, sort of more cyclical names, more value names. Um, and we saw the chart there of, of just the underperformance of, of those sort of value companies. But um, I mean, I guess how much further can that go? And why is it that Hyperion believes that sort of backing that structural winner is the right sort of approach to take? Well, I mean, everybody's looking for the mean reversion, yeah? But there are plenty of charts that will show you that there's been 40 years of outperformance by value, and there might be actually 40 years of underperformance by value, and I'm talking about deep value here. I mean, I'm not talking about what other managers perhaps here are doing, because I, I can see Jacob clearly is working on pragmatic value, which is a completely different idea, but sitting there and trying to buy busted flush companies cheaply uh, is not a strategy in a low GDP market because they're just unable to turn around if there's no GDP growth, there's no economic growth. They're getting outcompeted. There's a new world out there, you know, and it's been, it's been coming slowly, but here it is 20 years later, these modern businesses with access to the internet are just completely outcompeting uh, old world businesses. And it's very hard once they get that first mover advantage to uh, overtake them. And just to stay with you, um, Jacob uh, sort of mentioned growth traps. Um, yeah, how do you sort of guard against maybe yeah. 
um, something becoming a growth trap? Look, it, it's our greatest fear. Yeah, and that's why I said at the end of my presentation, like these 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 rules just don't apply to all companies. As Jacob has just said, there are huge numbers of SaaS businesses particularly focused businesses that could be easily um, outcompeted in the future and you can't lay your money in those bets. We're looking for businesses where we can see a line between their market share growth over the next 10 years and their earnings growth, not just this is a great idea that's going to work in the next year. Okay, um, Jacob, yeah, for you, I mean, I suppose a similar thing that, you know, value traps and growth traps and um, I mean, how, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, yeah, how are you trying to balance having some cyclicality in your portfolio and then sort of backing a bit like Hyperion, some of the sort of more structural winners? Look, it's, um, you know, obviously the, the more secular growth part of the portfolio has done, done much better. And <laughs> stating the obvious, the, in the cyclical bucket though, the, you know, I think it is looking for those companies. Those, these labels are always dangerous. So, you know, yes, there's commodities, autos, retail, financials, you know, they're economically sensitive sectors, but not all the businesses are going to be necessarily cyclical. And, uh, you know, there's best of breed companies in those, in each of those buckets that could, you know, can do well. Now, you know, energy, I think is probably the, the closest thing in our, you know, framework for a potential long-term value trap. Um, in the sense that, you know, you are going to get on the margin as we presented in the presentation, we're electrifying fossil fuels and we need to, the only reason you do that is if you replace the fossil fuel with renewables. You don't go and, you know, you don't turn your auto fleet into, a bunch, into EVs and power them with coal. That sort of defeats the whole exercise. <laughs> so coal, oil, um, at best they're supply stories. You know, you are seeing significant rationing of supply. And so if you get a really low cost, high quality producer, maybe you can make an investment case. Um, or you can go and look at maybe an, a VW or a company like that, which we think is misunderstood, um, you know, in terms of its transition to becoming an EV platform. Um, so within most of these cyclical parts of the market, you can find, let's call them platform opportunities, you know, semiconductors, TSMC has got an amazing lock. At, you know, it's where everybody ends up in the, in the semiconductor industry. Uh, yeah, so looking for the, the resilient businesses in each of those buckets. And there's, we would argue, probably more chance of finding, I think, pragmatic value there today. Yeah. And Andrew, for you, I suppose, um, there's certain sectors of your investable universe where um, there's a lot of money flowing and there's, there, there could be a, a growth trap. But yeah, how do you think about some of those where it's just very obvious that, you know, the retail sector, even the office sector is mm -hmm. just, I mean, everyone's talking about how sort of challenged they're going to be. So I know that you don't have uh, a lot of your portfolio allocated to office, but mm -hmm. there is a couple of names. So mm -hmm. yeah, how do you sort of pick through a sector that is just, yeah, incredibly challenged? Well, uh, yeah, office is, is fascinating to us because Office has always been challenged. Right? The work from home is the latest threat to office. The reality is that office, if you look back over the years, it's been a very volatile area. And again, it's been a very poor cash flow area. Tenant incentives have always been a feature in the office market because it's a very commodity investment class where you see constant levels of supply coming through uh, that really do act as a basically a constraint on potential um, performance. Uh, what work from home and work from anywhere has done is just the latest chapter in a whole series of challenges for what is a very challenged area. So to us, yes, it's, it's, it's not an area that we see great performance in the long term. You will see it when it's trading at massive discounts to, to replacement cost, it gets interesting at that level. But even in New York, it's been trading at a huge discount to, uh, sorry, you've seen high vacancy in New York for the last five, 10 years, and you're still seeing supply because of obsolescence, because tenants want the latest features, et cetera, et cetera. So for that area, we just don't get excited about, you know, the, the, the big shiny buildings. What we're more interested in is the effective cash flows, and we can find better cash flows with less risk in some of the other areas of the market. Now, you know, again, what we've found over the years is some of the ugliest property is in fact the best property you know, we had an investment in Link Rate in Hong Kong from basically since day one when it was listed. It owned terrible property. I mean, in terms of visually, 
uh, wet markets and rundown shopping centres but it was basic needs and the rents were very low. So you weren't paying a lot of money for a very strong cash flow. In fact, they sold their wet markets, thankfully, about three or four years ago at a yield which was about 2.5%. Now, when we bought into the portfolio 15 years ago, the whole portfolio was valued at about a 7.5% yield. So they sold their ugliest property at a 2.5% yield. Now, to us, again, it's about the cash flow and better appreciation of true cash flow uh, that, that really counts. And just stick, yeah, just sticking with you there on, on some of the sort of the more sort of sexy sectors of um, data centres and, and those sort of industrial, how, yeah, how do you guard against, because yeah. again, it's a, it's a trend that's very well known, you know, the stock price of NXDC and other, others. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, how do you guard against that? So, so again, there's data centres and there's data centres. There's wholesale data centres, which just literally store data and they're pretty low value to us. Then there's what's called these network dense data centers, which are literally like the old, serve the purpose of an old telephone exchange. It's where all the different internet connectors, connections occur, typically on cable fiber ne uh, networks, high power uh, uh, redundancy um, uh, that's required. So you just can't replicate that. And with the growth in traffic and internet of everything, you know, this is an ongoing key infrastructure area that's very hard to replicate that therefore the landlord has pricing power and that to we believe to be a long-term secular winner very very we think the, the returns are very secure so people keep underestimating it um, uh, and to us that's fine that's that, that's what we want um, but when they pay too much for commodity data centers we wish people well in chasing that thematic okay great um, maybe moving on um, and shifting gears a little bit and you know, from, from our meetings with, with you guys over the years, a lot of what you do is a lot of meeting with companies, um, understanding management teams, and I suppose at the moment it's difficult to do that, but with a lot of the stimulus, monetary policy, um, fiscal policy, um, how, you know, do you start to sense that might change how management teams allocate capital and, and take risks just because Money is almost free, um, and you yeah, can so the go. The government should just keep doing it every year. <laughs> just, just tip some more money in, make us all feel better. Why not? Seems to work, doesn't it? Yeah, but is there? I mean, I mean, we're turning Japanese. That's what's going to happen. I mean, if GDP growth goes the way that we think it will for the next yeah. twenty years, because population growth isn't there, there's all of these headwinds. Governments will just continually tip money in. That's what it's going to look like. And in that environment, you think. The structural massive, massive agency issues obviously yeah. money will go to the wrong way rorting will occur there'll be opportunities but there'll also be a, you know you'll invest in something if if you're not careful and the government will switch horses politically and all of a sudden that won't be funded anymore so you know it's it's not a free lunch yep in a pandemic everyone's a socialist mm. and, uh, <laughs> Well, I've seen maybe the Chinese are probably the least socialist today, ironically, yeah. of any government, yeah. right? So they're not going down that path. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and interest rates, real interest rates in China, well, let's say nominal interest rates in China are three, 10 years, trading at over 3%. Um, so, yeah, it's not quite right. I think, you know, if you think about, you know, and when you look at Japan, Japan did most of its QE, let's call it fiscal stimulus, you know, without an, an enormous amount of QE. Uh, it was funded internally it, and, you know, they've always run current account surpluses. So I think the world's maybe bifurcating into stronger currency zones and weaker zones. And, you know, the US went into COVID with a 4% fiscal deficit in a, you know, an economy that was booming, right? So, and, you know, and they've always been a, a trade deficit country and they still are with even with the tariffs that they've put in place so the us is going on it's i think quite a different trajectory to the rest of the world yeah you know, europe's trade big trade surplus always has internally funded system so i think you got to prepare maybe for a change in you know the us versus the rest of the world a yeah, much weaker dollar and a potentially ultimately even if i don't think we're permanently in a low growth environment which you know, Tim and I, we could debate it, I'm sure, ad nauseum. But uh, yeah, the US maybe just a, yes, the rate of growth is declining, but the composition of growth can be very different in any decade. Uh, and uh, so maybe a little bit more inflation um, in, or at least volatility in those outcomes. Um, so maybe there is a price to pay for open-ended fiscal stimulus. 
And Andrew, any, any other comments from you just on that sort of all the stimulus and the, maybe the moral hazard that it might create with, with the managers of the assets that you invest in? Look, I mean, to us again, what's been fascinating is to see the tension between the tenant and the landlord in certain areas at the moment and how they're playing that. And there's been certain groups that have been, I think, playing it very cleverly um, in terms of, you know, I've never heard a tenant complain that their rents are too low. And so they're using the pandemic to basically try and improve their lot. I mean, the latest is Qantas, you know, trying to threaten they're going to leave their Sydney headquarters, which is leased to a REIT with 12 years left on the lease. Well, good luck. I mean, Alan is obviously doing his best to, to try and negotiate a better position because he's seen his major competitor out there getting a cost advantage. So he's doing what he should try to do. But the reality is what we're seeing is, you know, you can't, unless we're going to have literally anarchy in contracts, then a lease is a lease is a lease. So what we like is the quality of the cash flow that comes from long-term leases. We think that that story remains intact. Okay. Great. Um, again, maybe just switching gear, um, and it's something that just we get a lot of questions about. I'm sure that the three of you get a lot of questions about, and it is sustainability and ESG, um, and it's interesting just just the comments you made. Yeah, I suppose it means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Um, but yeah, maybe at Hyperion. I guess your time frame allows you to be an ESG investor, but yeah, what are the what are the sort of the, the key things that, that you and the team mm. focus on? Well, isn't it interesting that um, just in recent years, um, there's an awful lot of asset owners that are starting to focus on products that kill their, their con the consumer, the customer, tobacco, um, that kill the environment, coal, and that kill other people, munitions. And I mean, that's just like, we've considered those uninvestable you know, you know, for the since inception. Mm -hmm. So like the, the winds are changing. I mean, people with real large amounts of money are actually saying you can't do this anymore. Where does it go from here? Well, we think it should go to sustainability of earnings. That's what it's like. I mean, you know, tobacco, we think in the very long term, you just kill off all your, all your customers. So <laughs> that's not a sustainable business and coal won't be, you know, steaming coal won't be either. So um, we think while there might be short term opportunities for some mm. traders to get into those and trade the opportunity. Uh, we think that um, the winds have changed and COVID's actually focused people's minds on what clear air feels like and, um, and uh, that'll just push this even further. And Jacob, with you, I suppose you can potentially capitalise from sort of the bad actors on, from an ESG perspective. How do you, how do you in, in sort of incorporate antiquities? Uh, it's embedded in the you know, bottom-up research process in the sense that um, you know, all of us, I think, you would have a minimum level of uh, environmental behaviour, governance, social, in all their investing companies and, and the ones that maybe are only just above that minimum, you're looking for evidence of improvement because that's good for all stakeholders, including shareholders. Um, in terms of the second aspect, which is really trying to interpret what, you know, what Tim's referring to, the outcomes, you know, because there's real world outcomes and then there's also investor preference outcomes. Mm. And we think, you know, decarbonisation is just a real world outcome. I think regardless of your political views over time, I think we're going down a path of decarbonisation. And, uh, yeah, obviously great investment opportunities are thrown up by that. And, uh, you know, in areas of the market that aren't necessarily super, you know, let's call it crowded today. You know, they're part of that dispersion opportunity. Um, yeah. And Andrew, I mean, you've, you've got a lot of reporting on sort of the, the carbon intensity of the assets you own and things like that. Um, apart from that sort of reporting side of it, how does it sort of play into your and the, the team's thinking when sort of stacking up an investment? Well, I can honestly say the listed market has been to us very constructive and proactive in, in the whole issue. I mean, there's always the risk of greenwashing and that's something we certainly are very cautious about. Um, we do believe in, 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 in walking the talk. And so what's been disappointing is that I think the landlords have actually been proactive. Some of the tenants haven't been as on board. So they do, you need, do need to see tenants and landlords working together. But then we see really interesting examples where it's going to putting the onus back onto investors to actually think about um, how it plays out and, and what they're prepared to pay. We've got a, a vehicle that's currently not in the portfolio, but we really like the, 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 the the, uh, the stock, it's called Alstria. They've got the option of, they've put the option back to shareholders. We can pay a dividend of 20 euros a share, 
or we can retain money to reinvest in the portfolio that's not going to be immediately earnings accretive, but it improves the carbon footprint of the, foot, the portfolio. Now, we can pay 19 euros a share, retain a euro to spend. We're giving you the option to elect. So I think that's the sort of engagement that we think is fantastic because it brings to the fore the whole issue. What are people really prepared to pay? How, do they really understand the issues? And um, you know, that to us is outstanding management to challenge investors. Maybe just, uh, I'm just sort of conscious of time, maybe, maybe sort of, maybe one more question. Um, and, and sort of the way that the three of you run money is active, concentrated, um, and this is a selfish question for me because we get a lot of questions about concentrated portfolios versus diversified. So I'd just be interested to get your take on why having a concentrated portfolio is the way forward. Um, and yeah, and why, you know, because you founded these firms, why, why that was the way to go first. And maybe we'll flip the order around. Andrew, maybe we'll start with you. You're sort of a concentrated investor. Well, let me start with my pet hate, which is the index funds. Um, you know, they are, they are leeches on the investment market. So let, let me be clear about that. In terms of concentrated, I've invested my money in the funds. I don't want to just spread the money around. I actually want to invest in what I believe to be stocks and real estate that is going to produce long-term wealth. Why have 100, when really, there's, you know, frankly, there's, we've got 45 call stocks um, that we think are capable of really producing the goods. Now, to, to own more, we think sort of, with spreading yourself too thin, you really basically want to support those stocks that you think are going to be the key outperformers. Jacob, maybe turn to you. Yeah, look, I mean, Antipodes' take on that is, I think it, there's a great focus gained from, you know, we wouldn't sort of go sort of obsessed too much by the stock count as opposed to, well, how many ideas are reflected in the portfolio across, you know, we have on average roughly 60 stocks in the long book. Um, we would say that's eight to nine different clusters. And we think that really adds productivity to the research process. You do a large piece of work on something like the semiconductor industry, you know, out of that, you're likely to find three or four opportunities across a sector that has, you know, 50 stocks in it. So, you know, we think that's an appropriate way to invest. Uh, so we get the, the benefits of some single name diversification, but in a fairly focused portfolio, productivity stays high your research and your analysts aren't spread too thinly. And it also, I think, is a way to think differently about risk management. You know, you're looking for, let's call it, low correlation between each of those sort of eight to nine ideas. And Tim, final word from you. Well, what you've seen, I mean, in our 24 year track record, we've always been concentrated and it's delivered the, the, the returns. That, that research I showed in my presentation, I mean, that, that number jumps out at you, 96% of businesses over a hundred years uh, actually did not deliver a return better than T-bonds. I mean, seriously, <laughs> it's, if there was ever an argument for concentration, that's it. Okay, all right. Gents, thank you very much. Um, we'll have to end it there, but please stick around for the rest of the program um, today because it's fantastic. Thank you, gents.